Hey guys, Anthony here, and I got a special announcement for you guys today. Guess what? We finally finished our private label MBA course. All right, this is what you guys all have been waiting for. I know you guys have been asking if I've been doing one on one coaching, group coaching, and all of that, but we decided to make a digital course in order to help more people at once, right? We realized that while we were helping a lot of people one on one, we were getting bombarded with like the same questions over and over and over again about like, you know, our processes, our systems, how we select products and things like that. So we decided to come out with a digital course. This course literally took us six months to create, okay? Like this is not like any other course out there, right? All the other courses out there, like honestly, I'm pretty sure they suck compared to what I've seen. I've downloaded the other courses, I've seen the other courses, I've paid for the other courses, just to see what we were up against, right? But all these other courses, they're made by people who like barely sell anything on Amazon, all right? So we walk the talk, we live and breathe Amazon, we're selling every day just like you guys, or just like some of you guys who want to do it, right? So we're living a lifestyle of, you know, being an Amazon seller. And it's freaking awesome, right? Like just last week, I was just at, I was just in Cancun with Nick and Fernando and 70 other million dollar plus Amazon sellers at the MDS conference, right? And it was an amazing experience for, you know, just to be surrounded by only million dollar sellers and up, right? And it was really rewarding just to see like, Fernando and Nick just talk about systems and processes and their team, right? And me talk about Facebook strategies. Facebook bot strategies that no one has actually ever heard of, even though they're million dollar sellers, right? And all these things that, you know, Fernando, Nick, and I talked about at the conference, right? These are gonna be things that we include inside our course, right? Just exclusive to our members and everything. But what I wanna let you guys know is that this week, we're having exclusive pre-sale access for anyone who signs up, right? So you're gonna get discounted pricing if you sign up right now before the course is launched. So also, this entire week, we're also doing a whole bunch of Facebook Lives over what we're going over in the course of each little module, right? So you guys can get a preview of what we're gonna be doing. So product research, product selection, pre-launch, you know, optimizing the listing, launching, right? How we launched in 2018, because things have changed just a little bit, right? And it's pretty crazy, because Nick and Fernando have their own way of launching, I have my own way of launching, and we created this beautiful baby. Um, and more, the boss to the wall spreadsheet has been totally revamped, and all these things have, you know, like, really, really came forward. But in this video, in this Facebook Live, you're gonna about to watch, Nick and Fernando are gonna jump into product research and selection, right? Product research is super, super important, because Choosing the right product is gonna lay the foundation down for everything else. If you can choose the right product, it makes optimizing your listing way easier. It makes PPC a lot easier, right? But if you choose a bad product, you can have all those other things like go really good for you, right? I mean, have it all optimized, such as you know your PPC and your pictures. But if it's a bad product, guess what? It's a bad product. All right, so I'm really excited for you guys to watch this, so go ahead, tune in right now, and you're gonna see Fernando and Nick live on Facebook. So if you guys do wanna see it live throughout the week, make sure you join our Deseller Tradecraft Facebook group. The link is gonna be in the comments below, and as always, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. See you guys. Hey guys, it's Fernando and Nick again from Seller Tradecraft. We're missing Anthony today, he's at dinner. Um, so we'll try to do it without him. Um, but yeah, this is going to be the first Facebook live kind of in anticipation for the course that again, like, you know, recapping yesterday that we've been working on for the last six months, uh, it took twice as long as we expected. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited. Um, I'm going to be covering a lot about product sourcing or sorry, uh, product selection, product research. Um, and actually what well, we actually, uh, a lot of the time do in terms of product development, uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the business. Uh, truthfully, because I think one, it's really exciting. It's one of the fastest ways to grow your business. Um, but it's always just fun looking for uh, like opportunity uh, when you're searching on Amazon. Because I know that if I launch, you know, if I have let's say five products right now, and I launch another five products, I can effectively double my business way faster than I can by like, you know, trying to optimize my Shopify or, you know, going to Walmart and going to retail, which is, I feel like what a lot of other sellers do. And so I feel like product selection has been one of the things that uh, honestly, we've really spent a ton of time on, like really looking at the analytics and trying to master um, because I think that has been definitely uh, one of the biggest things that's helped us get to eight figures so quickly.
Um, awesome. Um, okay, cool. We are sorry. I'm still just posting to this group. Is Maybe this live? Months. Yeah, it's live right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Sorry, uh, we're almost ready to get started. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I mean, product selection is uh, is really fun. Like we've done like pretty much uh, almost every category on Amazon, totally all over the place. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's fun. Something that you can kind of do in your normal everyday life, uh, which I think is kind of one of the interesting parts about it is that you know sometimes I'm like picking up something from the store for whatever reason if I'm not ordering everything on Amazon. Uh, but I just like look at a product. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like I'm gonna like write it down and check to see like what the volume is like when I get back home. And um, even sometimes, honestly, like on vacation, um, like one of the ones uh, that I actually kind of go as an example of what I'm looking at when I was doing like the videos for the course was I remember when we landed in Hawaii like around New Year's, um, I actually saw a bunch of people wearing Hawaiian lays, and I was like, oh, that's super random. Like you know, I should like look into that product, especially as it comes in time maybe for summer. Uh, where people might be doing like more kind of like luau's and things with their house, um, and it was a little bit saturated to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's I think one of the really fun things about product selection is that you can see it pretty much everywhere, especially because you know um, United States like as a country is <laughs> like really like a consumption culture I would say in terms of like a lot of material products and stuff. So it's a great place to be. Uh, in terms of being an Amazon seller, you know, selling um, physical goods. Awesome. Sweet. Did it work? Yeah, yeah. We're all set. <laughs> nice. Okay, cool. Okay, let's get started. So um, what's up, everyone? Um, yeah, Fernando introduced himself. Um, so Fernando is really our expert here when it comes to product selection. He's really kind of um, honed down that skill set when it comes to our business as you know, we've grown our business really by quite a bit um, to $10 million as of last year. We're growing past that this year. And really one of the core, I think, core competencies that we have is how we approach a strategy around product selection. So in this webinar, feel free to listen to questions um, in the Facebook Live. I'll just be moderating. I'll be asking Fernando some of the questions that some of you guys have already posted. Um, so let's go ahead and, and uh, get started. All right, Fernando, are you ready? Yep. Okay, cool. So uh, a pretty basic one, uh, but I think it's something that a lot of people have a question around, um, which is what uh, what ROI and profit margin do you look for as a bare minimum when establishing your products? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I guess just to start, you know, just like a, a preface. So when we look at profit margin, I think a lot of people look at it differently or they define it a little bit differently. Uh, so we use like a term called contribution margin, uh, which is basically your sales price and you subtract all of your variable expenses and then you get your contribution margin, like, I guess below, so you can see it. Uh, but yeah, so uh, you're going to subtract out your cost of good landed, you're going to uh, factor in your referral fees, your FBA fees, uh, your storage costs, you know, maybe inland shipments. A PPC, all of that kind of stuff uh, per unit, and then you're going to arrive at like your contribution margin. Um, so I would recommend personally a, a 28% contribution margin. That's what we use like internally, um, and that means you know for every like if I sold like a hundred dollar item for instance, then like our profit is going to be twenty eight dollars, and then from that twenty eight dollars, I can decide to reorder or I can kind of pump that into uh, a new product. And then in terms of ROI, I'm looking at about 150%. And so that means like, uh, you know, for every dollar that I'm investing, I'm actually getting two uh, 250 back, that original dollar, and then plus an extra dollar 50 back. Um, and that's like a huge, huge uh, part of running a consumer products business just because like every physical products business is going to run into cash, um, cash crunches. Like we run into it sometimes. Like if you read the book, shoe dog, uh, Phil Knight literally took, uh, Nike public because like they were constantly running into cash problems. And it, it's just like a part of being a growing physical products business. And so having really high ROI products is going to help you in that respect. Um, and, 
you know, you could wait for like these items that are like, you know, maybe 400, 500%. Um, and I, I mean, that, that's, that's awesome. But I feel like, you know, when you're really starting out, like if you're hitting that 28% contribution margin, 150% uh, ROI, it's got good volume, not that like saturated of competition. Like I definitely recommend uh, launching it um, because it's really about just getting that first win under your belt, like kind of showing that uh, this model like really truly works, um, which is, yeah, just, I mean, it was one of the things I think we doubted uh, very early on in the beginning. Um, but yeah, getting those two uh, and then you're pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think what a lot of people don't realize in private label is that um, because you're waiting so long for the inventory to come in China, it's really important to have high margins, right? Because you could do a wholesale business where you're doing 10% month, every single month, you're turning around that inventory. And that might be better than a private label product that you turn over three times a year because of shipments and restocks um, with only like, let's say 15%. Uh, margins. So I think, you know, from a, even from a product launching perspective, um, having as much margin or ROI from the get go is really important to um, pad yourself so that you have a lot more room, whether it's to spend on PPC, to promote your listings, or whatever. Um, yeah, I think that those are really good points. And I really loved that you nailed down on the, the ROI. A lot of people, um, surprisingly, don't know exactly how ROI is calculated. So ROI is net of after COGS and everything. So um, that's really important to consider. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. well, yeah. One thing to me I mentioned is that, like, you know, just the like, the nature of a marketplace is you're going to get margin compression. You know what I mean? Because if you're, yeah. let's say, on your own standalone like website, you know, I don't know, like tires.com, for instance, like you can set the price, and as long as like customers on your website, like you don't you don't really get margin compression. You might just not get the sale. But for instance, on a marketplace uh, and with a ton of other sellers. You know, if people like if their volume starts dipping, they could easily lower their price. And that means like, you know, it's the kind of race to the bottom. And so if you have, let's say, an item with 15 percent contribution margin or 20 percent contribution margin, and then people start lowering, then you're going to go to zero and you could easily like end up losing money. But if you start at 28, um, you have like a lot of room uh, for that product to go down and then still be OK. Awesome. Um, okay, next question. So someone asked, you know, when you're researching, um, do you use keywords to guide your research or do you look at the entire niche as a whole? Like, how do you evaluate that? Is key, are keywords very important for um, your methodology? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so we personally don't use keywords as much. Like, we'll make sure to test, like, what we think are the main keywords and make sure that there's not, like, different competition showing up. Uh, you know, if I like, use, like, a... You know, let's say the hooded baby towel versus uh, baby towel hooded or whatever. You know what I mean? Like if the, the results don't come out like like super different. Um, but I would say um, I have heard of other sellers doing it that way. I don't think like, it's necessarily a wrong way. Um, I think it just really depends on how many products you're trying to launch. I think in a normal month, we're probably launching 15 SKUs. Uh, and we're, we're constantly ramping that up. Like I think you know, probably the next few months, we'll probably be on average doing or maybe 20 to 25. And I think uh, really focusing on like the keywords is, is definitely doable. Um, but I think like, our strategy is more given uh, based on the existing competition. And so it's not as big of a requirement um, because we are like, in truth, we have like a 90% success rate. Um, so yeah, I think it's just a, a different strategy and I, th I think it can work well, um, but it's not what we do. Okay. Okay, cool. And um, so when you're launching a new style, I mean, here's another question. So um, let's say, you know, you're looking at a competitor and you see that this product is doing really well. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously you want to try to differentiate, right? You want to do something new. You don't want to sell the same thing. Yeah. So, you know, how do you decide how to upgrade the offer? Do you want to do an upgrade of an existing type of product? Um, do you want to do like a different color offering? Um, you know, how do you determine um, what kind of upgrade you want to do and what, what's going to be, be the most meaningful? Yeah, that's a uh, yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, I, I would think, it, I guess it really depends on like the product and if it really makes sense to be bundled or, you know, uh, change into a quantity pack or a color. Um, I would say, yeah, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, of course, go to the reviews. I think that's like a really easy place to start. And then um, I'll usually kind of click in on the two, three, or even four-star reviews. 
I feel like the one star people are really uh, kind of negative and the five star people are just like, you know, kind of like super positive, but the more critical ones are kind of in the middle. So if I'm really trying to change a product, I'll, I'll take a look at those, see kind of um, what the critical feedback is, see if we can change a feature. Uh, if I see that people are saying like, oh, I bought two of these for a friend or I bought like, uh, I bought a few of these for my home, then uh, that kind of indicates like, oh, you know, maybe I can do this as a two pack and then be competing um, against nobody because and offer more value. Um, and I think that the cool thing about that is that set, like selling a second piece is usually um, like as a one unit is much cheaper in terms of the FBA fees. And so what happens is your FBA fees drop as a percentage. And so your margins can really drastically improve by selling things like as a two pack, especially if they nest uh, well. And so, yeah, I mean, I would say like two pack is definitely some, like a way that we differentiate uh, really often. Um, sometimes we'll include like a really cheap accessory um, that's like useful and you can kind of see those sometimes in like people also viewed or people also bought with. Uh, so we'll throw something like really cheap in there just to be a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say those are probably the most like popular um, like, and they're like the fastest for us. Again, like we're trying to like churn and burn like launching those 15 SKUs every month. Um, but I would say like if you want to like kind of uh, really do something unique, uh, you can also just go to the reviews, uh, spend a little more time and like, kind of work with the manufacturer. But that's typically how I would say we differentiate our merchandise. Got it. And, and what, you know, how do you decide between which one you want to do? You know, let's say you you have, you know, you can do a different color offering with the same product. You can do, you know, one that is a bundle or one that's a two pack. You know, what what's your decision around whether which one to choose? Um, honestly, I think a lot of it's gonna have to do with the margins. So I'm gonna like I'm gonna play it all out like next to each other. So I'm gonna have them all like on a different row in Excel. So like this is like um, this is like, what happens if it's the existing uh, product in a different color. And then this is like, if I change like the, the feature, I think it's gonna cost me an extra dollar, but I think I can, you know, uh, charge another $3. And then this is what my margin is gonna be like. And then, you know, this is my margins if I do like a two pack. Um, and then it's kind of just dependent, like, determined on demand, or maybe um, if you have an audience already, or you wanna use a good website like uh, PicFu or Mechanical Turk, like you could actually just get a bunch of people to vote on like favorite color options. If let's say like it doesn't make sense uh, to do a two pack, but like they're selling it in black and you think that either blue or red is gonna do really well. You could, you know, ask a ton of friends or you could use one of those websites like Mechanical Turk or pickfood.com to determine like, you know, Photoshop the color and then see like what resonates better with people. Um, but yeah, I think truthfully for us, like it all comes down to the margins. So we're really focused on making decisions based on that. Totally. Um, I really want to hit home on the point that you mentioned, which was the, the, the increased margin from just adding that second pack, um, yeah. just to kind of break down those numbers. Right. So, um, you know, what we're talking about guys is let's say your product costs you a dollar. Okay. And you're selling it for two for $10. That's some, what someone is selling it for. And the FBA fees are, let's say $3. So let's say you do a two pack and it increases your fulfillment fees by, by only two bucks. So now your fulfillment is $5. So now your total cost, the two products plus a fulfillment fee is seven, but you could charge your product because it's, it's two times as valuable um, for $16. So you've actually increased your total amount of margin that you're making. Let's say the original was, was what, like $6. And now your new margin is going to be like $8 if you're charging 15 or $9 if you're charging 16, um, which is not crazy because you know people will look at that and say, oh wow, that's a, a way better value and it'd be way easier to sell because you're setting the price for that product. Totally, yeah, okay. could agree more. Yeah, cool, all right, so here's another question from the group. By the way, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to just drop them inside the, uh, the comments. We'll make sure to answer them. Um, I'm gonna go, uh, how do you determine or how do you estimate um, the freight costs when it comes to doing product research and determine how profitable the product would be um, when factoring that in? Oh yeah, that's a good one. Um, so that's tough. Uh, I would say, uh, so for, for freight, um, so yeah, we have like kind of an idea in our, like our head. I mean, honestly, launching over 200 products kind of gives you like a ton of 
uh, data points. But um, actually, and I might actually included this in the course. So uh, one of the things we did uh, is we we worked with our logistics person to actually come up with like four size items, and then I think it was like if we're shipping a thousand units, um, then what the per unit cost would be if it's like sent by air versus sent by sea, and then so it kind of gives you like a table and an idea based on like okay, if it's a shoebox, it's going to cost you like maybe forty cents, fifty cents per unit. Um, by sea and then, you know, like probably $3, $4 by air. So it kind of gives you that rough math. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, the, I mean, the, probably the best way is just to hit up your freight forwarder, say like, Hey, here's a carton size. I'm going to send this by sea. It's going to be, you know, 50 cartons and just like assume that it's going to go to Merino Valley. And I think that is probably like the easiest way to get like a more accurate quote. Um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, there are just so many variables between, you know, sending it by air versus sending it by sea. And that's just like, you know, there's obviously different like shipping options for both of those. And then, you know, depending on like how many units you're sending and you know, cartons. So, um, so yeah, that part is a little bit tricky, especially when you're starting out. Um, but I do think it's really, really important. Then you set up an Excel and then you keep track of it. And so I know like that's when we were first starting out, I just had an Excel for everything uh, in terms of like, all the products, like by SKU, and then how much we spent um, in terms of COGS per unit and then uh, freight per unit and then like our total cost of good landed per unit. And then so that helped me like eventually as we were kind of coming through estimates, uh, I could be like, oh, okay, well, that product's the same size as this product. So it should be give or take. If we're ordering the same amount of units, it should be about that much. Um, and that ended up being like really helpful internally uh, for like for future products. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then, like, you know, for profit margins. Um, so you're obviously going to take like your cost of good landed then from, from that calculation. You're going to take the 15 percent uh, for most categories for your referral fees. Your FBA fees are going to be pretty much fixed um, based on the product if you're not changing anything. Um, and then, you know, we budget about 10% for storage and ads, uh, combined and then, um, and then your storage costs, which or sorry, that's already included. So yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much everything in terms of your, your, uh, your profit margins. Yeah. You know, that, that brings up something that, um, I would love for you to dive in more into, and it's something that we definitely discuss in the course in detail, um, which is, you know, finding the arbitrage in the fulfillment fees. Right, because right now Amazon is constantly changing um, their fulfillment fees. A lot of people aren't super detailed when it comes to you know specifying to their manufacturers how they want to package. Uh, because oh, yeah. you know uh, one one different variation or size can go from eight dollars to twelve dollars, and that can drastically imp- yeah. uh, affect your margins. So tell me more about like how you know we've implemented that into our business and how you can find product opportunities that way. Yeah, I mean that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so I mean, and it's hard lesson. Like we've we've had like products that are like you know point one inch over, like, and it goes from large oversize or sorry, large standard size to small oversize. And then you know if we ordered like three thousand units and it's three dollars more expensive, that was like nine thousand dollars just like lost because of like point one inch or whatever, uh, which is brutal. And so, yeah, I mean, Amazon is like really unforgiving, I would say, in terms of uh, the cubic scan and then, you know, being oversized. So I would say like, yeah, really working with your manufacturer, um, making sure that you have some kind of margin of error, maybe like half an inch to three quarters of an inch, depending on the product uh, to make sure that it doesn't go over. Um, But yeah, I mean, one of our students had like, uh, they had like basically, they were selling a mat and it was really um a really like you know smart product but it was it was uh small oversized it's probably about like give or take uh 30 inches long i want to say and then what she did was that she decided to have the manufacturer sew a seam like down the middle and then so what was like a 30 inch product immediately became 15 and it actually went from like you know uh small oversized to large standard size so she was saving probably like around three or four dollars a unit in terms of FBA fees. And it was actually huge because uh, when she came in and launched against all of her competitors, they were all competing like, you know, at a way higher price. And she was able to make the same margins by char- and charging like four dollars less. 
Um, and so it was a huge competitive advantage. Um, and like, that's something that like you can't replicate that quickly because that means you need to like tell your manufacturer, they need to like order it. And I think it was like a 40 day production time. So by, and it was like a big product. So by the time it got in, that's another like hundred days probably. So she had like a hundred days to compete and have all those reviews and like, and all that momentum. And I think it was like the first product, I think it was generating, I want to say like maybe 30 grand a month. It was doing really well. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just like really understanding your FBA fees, especially as a percentage of your sale price, um, which is just super important. Totally, totally. Remember guys, every piece of kind of dollar that you have for margin is going to be a huge advantage because you need to spend that on marketing. That means you can drop your price. You have a lot more wiggle room. So the more margin you have, uh, the more opportunity you have to outsell your competitor. So this fulfillment fee structure and using that as an arbitrage opportunity is really, really something that a lot of people don't do. And it's something that you can really stand out from. So um, yeah, that's definitely something to consider. So, uh, and that's something that we, we definitely dive into in the course. Um, okay, cool. So uh, let's talk more about competition. So I know when it comes to product selection, you know, we've seen our, our fair share of videos. A lot of people don't talk about, comp I mean, competition in terms of like really, really understanding it in detail. They just say, don't choose a competitive category. Um, you know, don't choose a place that has like, uh, or a keyword that has more than like a certain number or hundred views. You know, tell me more about how you view competition. Like how does that work into our overall framework and our overall strategy when it comes to really, um, you know, doing well in private label on Amazon? Yeah. Oh man. Uh, yeah. There's so many factors. Um, well, yeah, first I mean, off, why is it important? Let's talk about why it's important, and then we'll I mean, let's talk about yeah. yeah. Um. So I mean, good competition. It, it it's it's hard because if if they're really a good competitor, like you're not going to be able to just like take advantage of them being like um, not as good of a competitor. To be honest, like we've had specific products where our competition is like really weak. They were they were doing I don't know like honestly sometimes like they're doing like a hundred grand a month and we come in because we're better like sellers we like understand enhanced brand content we understand PPC we understand keywords like we come in and very quickly are like outselling them and I think like that is like a huge opportunity like when you're understanding like okay this competitor like really honestly just doesn't know what they're doing they got really lucky with this product. And so if you can kind of, like, you can recognize that, um, you know, you can come in and take a huge majority of those sales uh, versus if you're coming in to a category that's like really saturated and has like really strong competition, that means that PPC is going to be more expensive because like, they know how to use PPC. And like, you know, you're, it's going to be harder for you to stand out amongst the crowd because they're going to have good images. They're going to know how like, they use their keywords properly. They have good bullet points. Like they have enhanced brand content. Like they've checked off all those boxes. So for you to stand out, like you're, you're going to have to like launch more or you're going to have to somehow like figure out this like really creative way to like launch your product or build an audience or whatever, or just honestly like outspend them. And like where we found like, it's definitely an effective strategy, uh, but it's a really expensive strategy and where I, we don't ever like want to just like constantly have to just outspend them because we know there's like thousands of other products that we could be doing and not having to like outspend our marketing. So it just doesn't make sense uh, for our business model. Right, right. And, and the less competition that you have, um, the more opportunity you have to dominate, right? So you know, that gives you room to basically um, continue just like la launching more products. So um, right. yeah, that's something we definitely go into detail. I think knowing and looking at a category and being able to tell just by looking at it, whether it's it's good to enter or not, is such an important skill. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like, yeah, it's something that we've really refined. So um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely set us apart. Um, okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Um, tools that we use. So what are some tools that you use to make sure that you know, you are um, doing your product research effectively. Um, yeah, what are some tools that you find helpful? Yeah, um, so for sure I love Jungle Scout and Market Intelligence. Both their uh, Chrome extensions are super, super helpful in terms of yeah, just pulling uh, all of the BSR and the revenue and like um, all of the kind of necessary uh, criteria into one easy place to look at the reviews. Um, and then uh, also like the ratings on the reviews. I think all of that 
is um, those are definitely what we use the most, I would say, over anything. Um, we've just started um, to integrate a little bit of like keyword research uh, using like seller tools, which I think is helpful. So like if you're uh, trying to understand like where the volume is coming from, then like we might add like a product into there and then look at the, the the real Amazon data, like in terms of like search volume for those products. But honestly, um, a lot of the products, uh, I would say the majority of the products we're not doing that for. Um, but yeah, I would say those are probably the two best tools, like um, you know, Market Intelligence and Jungle Scout. Um, I know a lot of people use the web apps, which I think are great, and I think it's like it's really easy to kind of filter and everything else. Uh, personally, like we don't use those tools because we know how easy that is, and so we just we've seen we've done it a few times. We've seen uh, where we get really excited because this product is generating thirty grand a month and it's got like thirty reviews. Uh, and it's small and you know fits in a shoebox and all that kind of stuff and then like so do 40 other people and so typically we're um, we're kind of using like the more um, the more manual approach I guess you would say uh, by using the extension going through like subcategories and all that kind of stuff awesome awesome um, really good and um, what about like long-term strategy like, you know, how does kind of your long-term strategy play into when you're researching a product? Because a lot of people, you know, they'll say, oh, I want to do this product. Now I want to do this product. Um, you know, uh, let's, let's think like six months ahead, right? A year ahead. You know, how do the decisions you're, you make right now impact your overall strategy if you want to create like a long-lasting, you know, business? How, how is it shown in our business? And, uh, you know, what kind of tips can people take away from our experience? Yeah, uh, for long-term strategy, yeah, I mean, so uh, so I see this all the time, and like we truthfully, we did this in the beginning, uh, where we would start and we would launch like I don't know a camping tent, and then like the uh, the next um, the next product would be like a garlic press, and then the next one is like kitchen knives, and we we're just kind of all over the place, just testing everything, and I think you know maybe you launch those like that like garlic press, let's say, and it just kills it, like it's got like. 200% ROI, it's got like a 30% contribution margin percentage, and like it's just doing super well. But I think a lot of people's tendency is then to keep looking for another one of those, but they're gonna do it in a completely different category or subcategory. But like in, in that situation, I think what we've learned over time is like, okay, you see garlic presses are crushing it. So we wanna like actually cannibalize ourselves and just take over that specific category. Cause we realize, okay, the PPC is actually really cheap in this category. We've realized, um, you know, the product's small. So like our storage costs are not that high. And like, you know, it was really easy for us to rank. We didn't have to do like massive, massive giveaways. And so that is like the perfect category for us to go into. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do like we're gonna take over that category. Like, yeah, I, I can't remember the term like the monopoly method. Um, but it's like you want to take over that entire side or for all of those keywords. So you want like you know red garlic press and black garlic press and like you know sets of garlic presses and like you know different materials and like um, you know different handles and like you know every single kind of like variation. Because you want to be like as well known as like Kleenex is for tissues, as you know, you know, my garlic presses is for like that specific category. So that one, and I think one of the cool things is like when uh, like you know stockouts eventually happen, and like it's inevitable in this business. But like the nice thing is your bestseller stocks out, then it's not that bad because you have these five other listings that are going to start like absorbing the sales and like climbing rank. Versus if you just like invested in this one listing that's carrying that entire category for you and then it's out, then like that like, really hurts your bottom line. Um, but yeah, I would say like that's been like our like bringing back like our long term strategy in terms of we look for these niches where we know that like, OK, like this for sure has like a good amount of room. Like I don't want it to be a category where there's I only fit in like one listing and then I don't really see like a clear path to expansion. So I wanted to have like enough, like I, I, we call it greenfield opportunities, where there's enough room for like five, 10, 20 listings. They're gonna generate like X amount of profit per month. And I'm like, okay, yeah, this this makes sense for us. Um, and that's a kind of like our, like what we've kind of shifted to in terms of long-term strategy. 
Totally. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think what we've been selling for, for just over three years, right? And yeah. we've launched so many products, like 250, 200, 250 products. Um, I can't even count anymore. But like, you know, what we've realized is that, especially in the beginning, that so many of those products had such a short life cycle. And yeah. so, you know, we might find a product and we're like, oh yeah, this garlic press is so great. Let's go after it. And really there's only room for one more competitor. So we enter, we're like number five, we're doing okay. And suddenly a lot of people experience this, there's a massive decline in sales, right? And it happens yeah. over six to seven months. Um, and eventually it's like that product is useless and people are trying to figure out ways to manipulate that and drive your ranking to the top. And, you know, at the end, net, net, are you really profitable? That's the question. And mm -hmm. so, you know, one thing I, I really want to hit home and, and something that we really, um, you know, are, are structuring this course around is just the importance of building a sustainable business beyond just like a one-time, you know, a one-time product. And like you said, I mean, the, the, the thought around, you know, um, shooting after dominating category allows you to build sustainable products. I mean, we have some products now that have been going strong for like two years. And it's because we've like done so many different variations right across so many keywords. Um, mm -hmm. So our, our staying power is so much better. Um, yeah. yeah, really, really great now, point. I mean, and other things we didn't even talk about, which I think is super important, but like, if you're going with that strategy, like the original strategy of, you know, going after a knife and then, you know, the, the garlic press and then the tent, like the challenge is you're gonna have no like, uh, economies of scale in terms of supply chain. So like you have no like leverage with your manufacturer, you have no like consolidated shipping, like everything is gonna be a little bit more challenging. And I, I think that's fine in the beginning, but once you find that like home run, those like garlic presses, then like you really want to like kind of double down there because you're gonna um you're gonna start like spending way more time like understanding the keywords. And so you're gonna care a lot about, about the category. It's way faster for you to launch like 10 new garlic press listings than it would be to launch, you know, 10 in like various uh, subcategories or niches. Um, so there's a, just a lot of like economies of scale that comes from that. And then if you have three, um, three SKUs or more than you can do like headline ads, like all that kind of stuff plays a really big part into dominating those categories. Totally, totally. I mean, this goes as far back as supply chain, right? I mean, you know, we, we went to this million dollar conference and, you know, there were a couple of people who would like, like 1500 listings with just one manufacturer, or like five manufacturers. And I mean, that's crazy to us. Cause like, we still have what, like 30 manufacturers at least. Um, but like, uh, you know, we want to shrink that as much as possible because guys like think about it when you have one manufacturer and you're doing so much business with them, you mean a lot more. And that means that you can negotiate better, you can get better pricing. And with that, that's a competitive edge and an advantage against your competition. So, you know, it all kind of plays into this long-term strategy of, you know, how do you dominate and how do you build a book of business with a, with a supplier become important enough to them to where no one else can replicate that relationship that you have. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, okay, cool. I think that's um, that's pretty much it for now. I think in terms of questions, you know, it seems like a lot of people they're actually watching the NBA finals. I guess I totally <laughs> forgot that that was happening. Uh, <laughs> go Cavs! <laughs> no, they're gonna lose. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess, like you know, um, why don't you kind of spend some time right now before we sign off, Fern, about um, about kind of what we delineate in our course? Like, what? Why is it that? you know, product selection is something that we really hone in on. What is it that, that you think sets us apart in the uh, product selection category? Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, I, I think it's like, what sets us apart in being able to teach this is uh, we've launched, yeah, like 200, 250 products. Like I'll actually go through and show you like, like exactly, you'll have access to like our template um, and exactly how we evaluate products against each other. So you have like a really good understanding of like what your margins are going to be because honestly I see it so many times where people like don't like properly account for it and so they launch a product that wasn't going to be profitable from the beginning like if if, if we had like either of us looked at the product we would have been like oh no like ne no way you're like you're going to lose a ton of money um, or like the competition's way too fierce so like I mean, I think that's uh, one of the cool things is that you can like, kind of watch over my shoulder and then watch me as I like look through the niches and then figure out like, okay, this category like really can be disrupted. Like this is a, a really powerful category in terms of of launching 10 SKUs. And like, this is something that I would go after if I wasn't like broadcasting it in the video. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I would say like that will go through like merchandising assignments. So it's like, okay, like here's two products and then like, 
you know, I, I'll give you guys like a chance to actually merchandise it yourself. And then you can compare it against how I decided to merchandise the product, um, which may, be, may or may not like um, be like the same way that you did. So you kind of see how we kind of think about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, we cover like a ton of different stuff. So like everything about like, you know, how to handle like patents. We, look, uh, we cover like seasonality and how to account for it. We'll, um, you know, honestly, like understanding competition is like one of the biggest things um, because like, we're, like I know we haven't really covered this that well, but like product selection is like that first kind of domino and it makes everything easier if you choose the right okay. product. Because if you go after this super saturated uh, product, I don't know, like that Garcinia Cambogia co- a product, like you're going to if you decided to go into that, it's super saturated. Like even if you got great pricing because your uncle owns a factory, which is great, but you're still, no no matter what, even if he owns the factory, you're still going to spend like thousands and thousands of dollars trying to get that product to ring because it was just too saturated. And then you're going to spend a ton of more money, like keeping it like hopefully on that first page or second page uh, using PPC where uh, for us, like we know like how to look for those niches that we're not going to have to do that. And so it keeps our ad spend down, keeps like uh, our like, you know, blast budget like down. And, um, and yeah, so I think like product selection is one of those kind of like cornerstones to the business. Like, yeah, like you can take a bad product and eventually blast it to the top and get it to stick on the first page. But like, why do that? Um, when, if you really understand how to evaluate your competition effectively then like everything else in like the business is going to be so much easier. Totally. Yeah. And, and one thing to really note is, I mean, we talked about this earlier, but we have launched so many products that we failed so many times, right? I mean, <laughs> failed so many times. And so, you know, a lot of the techniques, techniques that we're teaching um, are based around kind of our failures and what we found to really build sustainable long-term growth. Um, and so someone asked like, you know, what are your suggestions with the new review changes? And like, what are the, the that's the biggest challenge right now. How can a s- small seller evolve? And I think, you know, my point to hit home and that is that it ties in exactly what we're talking about, which is that if you choose the right category that you can dominate, you know, one that's not as competitive, one that you've evaluated effectively, your marketing becomes cheaper. You know, getting reviews doesn't matter as much. It's easier for you to get reviews to even be relevant uh, for the first page. Everything just comes into place. Uh, your marketing is going to be cheaper. Um, all that stuff comes in and you can launch more products. You'll have room Um, to have more listings. And that means you're building an actual business that will last a long time. Um, And so that's really what we're trying to hone in. You know, we don't want to push anything that's like, you know, hey, you can make a so-and-so money in this much time. You know, I mean, we don't want to guarantee that because, I mean, yeah, you could, but that's not long lasting necessarily. So, you know, a lot of the things that we touch on is really built around having a long lasting business. Totally. Awesome. Okay, um, cool. I think, yeah, final question that I'm going to have you answer, Fern, is, Beyond what we just talked about, how can a small seller evolve now when it comes to product selection? Or do you think we've kind of covered that already? How can they evolve? Yeah, how can a small seller right now in this like era, you know, uh, evolve? Evolve. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say, yeah, I mean, I, I think like, yeah, a lot of the stuff that we covered and like, honestly, like I, I think it just like, really, um, like, building your like understanding of how you like you evaluate that um that competition like again yeah i covered it more like in the videos yeah but like i think that is like fundamentally what uh what determines like the likelihood that your product becomes profitable or not and so i I think like really spending time like uh, looking at the um at your competitors and like being like okay are they ppcing or are they not like how long has the listing been around like you know how many reviews have they gotten in that period of time like, um, do they have enhanced brand content? Do they look like they're using their keywords properly? Um, like all of that kind of stuff is super, super important. So like, as you start evaluating, like getting a better handle of evaluating that kind of stuff, um, it gets better. Like you kind of like size up like your competition really, really quickly. And I think that has been, um, definitely one of the big things that I've like learned over the years. Um, and that just makes it, um, so much easier because I'm like, oh man, they're not PPCing. Like, what are they doing? And like, just kind of like understanding that kind of stuff uh, just makes it like where I'm way more confident um, in terms of like ordering even more inventory, 
which I think is like a huge thing because you know a lot of people will teach you to like order a hundred units on AliExpress and like airship them over and like I don't know it's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, but like so like yeah they they teach that which is like okay fine like yeah you tested it for really cheaply but then you still have to wait another like month and you paid like an exorbitant amount versus like if you really were confident in this product because you knew how to evaluate the competition then you feel more comfortable ordering like 1500 units like right out the gate and then you actually become profitable on your first order where i feel like if you're ordering 100 units and then you're ordering 200 units and then you're ordering 500 units then you're not going to be profitable for like you know till next year which i i mean maybe that's okay for some people but i i would rather just like be more like a sniper and like choose the right products and then like make money the first order versus like doing a hundred units of like these like 80 products, like building listings, paying photography for 80 products, and then like only having like 10% workout. But that's totally. me. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, again, like, you know, you, you remember when we used to be able to buy reviews, right? We could just buy reviews yeah. whenever. We could just rank our way to the top using like, you know, some uh, giveaway service like Viral Launch. I mean, you know, it's getting more and more frequent that Amazon is shutting those things down and those things are becoming less and less useful. And mm -hmm. so, you know, being able to nail this down is going to become even more crucial now than ever. And this is something that's never going to go away, right? You'll always, you know, if you can evaluate your competition effectively, you can always do that. And that's not something that Amazon's going to take away because they want you to be able to do that. They want you to find opportunities. Right. Um, and so the better you are at finding opportunities, you know, the more seasoned you will become as an Amazon seller and the more you can build a real business. So um, awesome. Great. Um, and so, guys, uh, that wraps up um, the product selection uh, uh, live Q&A. Um, we are going to um, a lot of people are asking questions around like inventory or like reviews and whatnot. Um, we're actually going to do lives every single day. So um, we're going to be covering basically every single chapter in our module or in our course, um, giving you a preview of some of the content that we're going to be covering um, just so you can get a feel of like, you know, what it is that we're going to be discussing. And hopefully it'll also offer something of value to you guys. So tomorrow we're going to post some question or post to make a post to ask some questions. And Fernando, you're going to be uh, hopping on again, right? We're going to be talking yeah. about sourcing, manufacturing. Uh, sourcing, yeah, manufacturing, uh, air freight, Supply chain, all, that all that stuff, all that good stuff. Fernando is a pro at this stuff. So um, we will see you guys tomorrow uh, and it will be around the same time, um, hopefully sometime between 5 to 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah. Pacific. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, keep those questions ready and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks. All right. Bye.